Imagine, if you will, one girl telling another, but my dear green tires just don't do a thing for your complexion. Good year. You've got this wrong. No one cares about tires that much. Today's video is brought to you by Squarespace. More on them in just a bit. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Brain Blaze. I, as always, am your host, Simon Wise Happens here. Danny has written me a script. I'm going to read the script. I'm going to add my own thoughts if I feel like it. That's what we do here. Afterwards, Sam, the wonderful video editor, he adds some memes and sh I'm adjusting this microphone because I put it in a new position and I'm not sure if I like it. Let's go. Oh, by the way, this is amazing products the company's promised but never delivered. Thanks, Danny. The Gaga goggles. Even some of the greatest and most reliable tech innovators of the modern era have occasionally made promises that they couldn't keep. Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, Lady Gaga. Lady Gaga? Oh, the Gaga goggles. Oh, Lady Gaga, you're so weird. You're so, I still think you're weird because you wore a meat dress. What was up with that? But is it fashion? <laughs> it's fashion. <laughs> The last name might seem a little bit of a curveball, but we shouldn't forget that Lady Gaga once briefly served as the creative director of Polaroid from 2010. She did? Does Polaroid still exist? I thought po it's Polaroid. We've got digital cameras now. Why wouldn't we have the Polaroid? Hardy was insistent that Lady Gaga wasn't just providing a celebrity endorsement and that she spent a great deal of time working closely with the hired design team Ammunition on creating the next generation of Polaroid products. In that case, I'd question your business sense. Why are you hiring a singer to develop new products? That makes no sense. That would be like hiring me to snap. That's not a good analogy because I don't develop products. <laughs> But it would be, it's like hiring someone who does like something to do something completely different. Just because someone's really good at one thing doesn't mean they're good at other stuff. Like me. I'm good at making YouTube videos. I'm reasonable at making YouTube videos. Not good at quantum physics. Just because I'm good at one thing doesn't mean it's good at yeah, another thing. What's going on? The creative director of Ammunition was slightly less gushing on his appraisal of the pop icon's involvement, which included attending meetings and providing feedback. She's fairly involved with the process, he reveals. By 2011... <laughs> that's, a, that's a very political response, isn't it? By 2011, Lady Gaga was ready to reveal no less than three of her exciting new collaborations with Polaroid at the Consumer Electronics Show. She appeared in person to talk about a new instant digital camera, an instant portable printer, and most intriguingly of all, a new pair of camera sunglasses. Uh-oh, sounds like you're going to get in trouble when people are like, I invades my privacy! Ah, 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 ah. Those people, people are getting beaten up for wearing, like, Google Glass and <laughs> People need to get a grip, man. What the f***? Also, I, I, I just realized, I think a friend of mine had one of these little Polaroid portable printer things. It was stupid. Why would you want this? Friendship over! Although the official name of that last product was the Polaroid GL20 camera glasses, they were more often referred to as the Lady Gaga glasses or the Gaga goggles. Not everyone was taken by the presentation for these new products. The journalist for the next web reported, I've never heard point and shoot photography sound so confusing as I did when listening to Lady Gaga. But those sunglasses sounded pretty cool, even if Lady Gaga didn't bother to model them herself, preferring to showcase them on a surprisingly detailed naked mannequin. What sort of details did that mannequin include, Lady Gaga? Were they hidden behind a meat dress? Perhaps she was worried that she might look a bit silly in them as they were a fairly chunky bit of kit which took over your entire face. Sam, I don't know what these look like, but put it on screen now. I'm just using my imagination. I bet they were a bit heavy on the nose, too. Still, it might have been worth the ridicule. The Gaga goggles contained a 5 megapixel camera which could capture images and video whilst you were wandering around a majestic urban landscape, a nightclub, a public toilet, or the fruit and vegetable aisle of a busy supermarket. Yes, this is the reality of things. Somehow, if someone said to me, you will have cameras in your pocket and people will be sharing every moment of their lives on something called instagram i'll be like what the f are you smoking everyone's lives are really boring yet somehow yet somehow people have managed to make their lives look super interesting i promise you they're not as interesting as you might think people are like simon why don't you do anything on instagram and i'm like because my life is very boring like i love my life i have a fantastic life but it's the same every day I just go to work. I see my family. I spend time with my wife and kids. That's it. On, on the weekends, I like go to the countryside or maybe I'll take a little trip or often I'll just stay the f at home. 
But there are people out there who somehow make their life look amazing. It's like, look at this great food I made. Look at this meal I went out for. And I'm like, I do those things. And I, I also don't like sharing that. Because I'm like, I don't know. That's my personal life. You can f*** it off. <laughs> And yet this, you could even then play back the images and videos on the exterior of the lenses for people around you to enjoy. Really? They, no wonder it was bulky. You could also transfer files onto the goggles via either Bluetooth or USB port located on a bit that wraps around your ears. Oh my god, this must have been mega bulky. Like 2011 USB ports, weren't they? These are like the big old USB ports. And apparently the sunglasses also help protect your eyes from the sun handy. But fast forward a few more years from the CES presentation, and there was still no sign of the goggles. Polaroid insisted that they were working on a camera that would be that would exceed expectations, but by 2014, the company had very quietly parted ways with its creative director with no signs of any of the promising products. What a surprise, hiring Lady Gaga to be your lead of creative product development at a photography company didn't work out shocking. Perhaps a big issue with the concept of the goggles is that they were unlikely to provide more than 10 minutes worth of fun after the initial novelty gimmick wore off. I can't think of too many real-life situations in which you'd need to be constantly taking pictures and sharing them on a tiny display screen with the person standing right next to you. It's weird, isn't it? It is weird. Although people will be- I, I say it's weird, but let's return to Instagram for a second. Two people will be on holiday together, and they'll be taking Instagram photos of each other, and then going onto Instagram to like each other's photos. Oh my god, I sound like such an old man, but it is crazy. Can't we just enjoy our lives? Do we have to photograph every moment of it? Can't we just enjoy our nice things? Without having to tell the world about all the nice things we're enjoying? Double click! Double click! Oh, what the- I don't mean this to be like philosophical. I don't give a sh- It's just weird. It's just weird. Like, I love things. I just like how- I just like enjoying them. But that's weird now. People are like, why aren't you sharing that? Why aren't you sending me a photo? I don't know. I just f- good time, aren't I? I'm such an old man. Jesus Christ. Shut the f- People already hate you. And I'm sure there are simpler and more effective ways of sharing photographs and video with friends that don't involve turning your whole face into a slideshow projector. Fair play, though. Fair play on that. But who knows what the future might hold for Polaroid. Gonna say it's not bright. Allegedly. And I can't wait to see who they employ as their next creative director. I've got a tenor writing on the islands, boys. I'm an islands boy. <laughs> da -da -da -da. Those guys faded fast, didn't they? To uh, absolutely nobody's surprise. Are they still on Cameo? <laughs> I'm an islands boy. <laughs> Watching it. Someone, I was, I was like, Cameo. I was like talking about Cameo in the last video. And I was like, how it's just, I don't know. I have enough money. I don't need to, uh, like, why would I do this? I'm busy. I'm busy and I don't really need more money. I mean, I love more money, but to do Cameo, it just feels like, I like making things that lots of people see, not individual things for specific people. Does that make sense? Or am I just being a prick? I'm not sure, but either way. And I was like, and it's like for a hundred bucks, why would I do this? And then people were like, dude, people charge like 20 grand for a Cameo. And I'm like, that's insane. And that comes with the other problem. I could never do that because unless it's Raid Shadow Legends, I'd really feel like I'm ripping them off. Also 20 grand's probably a bit, I'd probably be asking a bit much. <laughs> Yeah, what a birthday message. 20 grand. <laughs> Have you ever thought you'd like to start your own thing on the internet? Maybe you've got an idea. Maybe you want to start a blog to talk about your opinions and thoughts or, I don't know, recipes. Maybe you're a cook. That's a random one. You could start a recipe blog or whatever you're into. Like, get it out there in the world. This is a well-trodden path that you can go down with and you should do it on Squarespace because it's never been easier. But not just blogs. Maybe you just want to start a website, just a regular site with like, I don't know, pages and memes and stuff like that. Or uh, a shop. You can start a shop with Squarespace to sell stuff online. Start your own little business. Brilliant. Or even a YouTube channel. I mean, you don't do the YouTube channel on Squarespace, but you want a like website to go along with it, won't you? A place for people to reach out and contact you and tell you their terrible ideas for videos. That sort of stuff is brilliant. And when you're ready to make that site, you should do it with Squarespace. What you do with Squarespace, you head on over to their website, you click on this. There's tons of beautiful templates and they're all like super modern and nice. And then you just choose one that you like and then you customize it to your own thing. You throw a logo 
up, throw some text, put some pictures in there. Easy does it. Uh, or if you're making a shop, you just do the similar thing, but just with the shop settings. And uh, what else? They've got tons of extra features that you can add. Member areas, email campaigns, collect donations, analytics, blogging tools, connected social media accounts. All essential stuff for making a brilliant website. And when you're ready to get started, all you need to do is go to squarespace.com slash blaze and you'll get 10% off your first purchase, which is lovely. And now back to today's video. Watching the wheels. During the early 1960s, Goodyear released a newsletter which unveiled what was dubbed the most dramatic tire development in the history of the industry. And what exactly was this whole new frontier of the tire of tomorrow? Oh my god, I already know it's glowing tires because I've just made a video about this on another channel that I do called Side Projects, but we're like two months ahead there, so no one's seen it, and they'll think that this came first, but it's glowing. Tires, just wait for it. It's light bulbs. And it's not even like genius, it's just light bulbs inside tires. It's not some magical rechargeable material. It's just light bulbs. And not even LEDs, like old school light bulbs because of the past. While that was the tires came in pretty illuminated colors, it should be noted that Goodyear didn't set out to create illuminated tires. They had been experimenting with creating tires from a new synthetic rubber called neothane, which would apparently be much simpler to produce than the traditional tire made from several layers of rubber and fabric. A bonus from using this new translucent material is that it could be dyed with various different colors, and Goodyear decided to take this colorful concept a few steps further by shoving 18 tiny bulbs inside each tire to give it a cool glowing effect it's weird isn't it but it is kind of cool it is like, i'd never put this on my car because i just don't want people to be like i don't i don't want to be rolling around with the only guy with like bright glowing tires like the person who puts those lights underneath their car that light up the street for some reason those people are idiots why do they do it's like uh, what you so you've drawn my eyes to your car because it's never like it's not like someone's driving past in a in a LaFerrari and it's got those lights underneath. It's always like it's on a Subaru or something from like 1997. And it's like, why have you done this? Why you've just drawn attention to how you're poor and have spent the little money you have on something stupid. If anyone's got those watching this, just turn them off. You don't have to remove them. Just turn them off. Just do it. <laughs> Statistically, there's probably someone in the audience who's got that. I'm not apologizing for my comments. And if you're driving a Subaru from 1997, I think that's statistically less likely, but still possible. Let me know in the comments. Subaru, Subaru! Vroom, 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 vroom. Now, I would imagine Goodyear might have tried to promote some kind of practical benefit from this, and they did mention in the press release that the new lights could be controlled by the driver so they could potentially be used as brake lights or turn signals, but they seemed far more interested in promoting the idea that the missus could shape her wardrobe and hairstyle and mood around the color of the tires. To quote the press release, Imagine, if you will, one girl telling another, but my dear green tires just don't do a thing for your complexion. Goodyear, you've got this wrong. No one cares about tires that much. Although it would be pretty, it, it would be a flex, wouldn't it? Where you have cars, so many cars that you have different colors to go with your outfit. Like paint colors, not tire colors, because tire colors are idiotic. Although the tires were installed on a single Golden Sahara 2, solid name for a car right there, the most dramatic tire development in the history of the industry was ultimately sent to the scrapyard when Goodyear realized that they were too expensive to produce commercially. They also performed very, very poorly in wet conditions and had an unfortunate tendency to melt when the driver braked a little too vigorously. Like, things that are important to me about tires. Number one, safety. Number two, fancy lighting. And there's, a, there's, there's like a big margin between those two. It's not like they're right close to each other. It's a big margin. During test runs, it was also noted that other motorists on the road were so entranced by the translucent glow that they went through red lights and could potentially knock down equally enthralled pedestrians. I suspect that another little problem with the concept is that tires tend to get very dirty very quickly after just a few miles on the road, so these pretty new tires would soon lose their shine when they were covered in mud and grit and horse Good luck trying to match your outfit and mood with that, my love. Oh, easy, just go outside and roll around in some sh**. <laughs> ah, no. The Nintendo PlayStation. The prototype of the PlayStation looked very much like a SNES. And that was because the new system was originally intended to be an unusual collaboration between two Japanese giants, which would bring together Nintendo cartridges and Sony CD-ROM games into one hybrid system. Unfortunately, one of those giants ended up pulling a fast one at the very last minute, only to find that it had very much shot itself in the digital foot and given its new rival a future on the plate. Now Nintendo Switch is around, so they've come back. But PlayStation was pretty f 
dominant for a long time, right? It's like Lamborghini and Ferrari. Didn't Lamborghini come about because Ferrari was like, you make tractors, mate. You could never make a sports car. Uh, you're stupid. What do you know? And he made Lamborghini, Ferrari's biggest competition. And it's like, whoops, a doodle Enzo. Whoops a daisy. By the late 1980s, Nintendo was looking beyond the SNES cartridges and contemplating a move into the emerging CD ROM market. A deal was struck with Sony in 1988, which would see the simultaneous development of two pieces of kit the new standalone hybrid console, which could run both SNES cartridges and new CD ROM games developed by Sony, and was often nicknamed the Nintendo PlayStation. What the hell is even that? Sounds weird mashed together, doesn't it, with our future brains? But it was also commonly known at one time as the SNES CD or the Super Disc. The good news for existing SNES owners was that they wouldn't have to splash out on a whole new console. The other piece of kit was a CD-ROM add-on for the SNES, which would effectively convert the old console into the new hybrid. I remember being a kid and I got a PlayStation. Uh, it was like the original PlayStation, you know, that gray thing, and it was awesome. And I remember being very confused by the fact that I couldn't put a PlayStation disc in the computer and expect it to work. I was like, why isn't this working? Why can't it? It's, it's the, the games on the disc. Because I was like seven. No, I was younger than that. I was really young. And uh, yeah, that confused me. Wait, when did the PlayStation come out? Because that's how old I was. Was I really that young? Jesus. There's only been five generations. It's quite a lot of generations. However, Nintendo president Hiroshi Yamauchi suddenly decided that his company was getting the end of the stick with this new deal. Whilst Nintendo would retain the rights over the cartridges, Sony would have to com would have complete control over the shiny new disc format of the future, and Hiroshi felt that this was tipping the balance of power a bit too heavily in Sony's favor. Uh-oh, you're about to make a tactical error. Like elephant dick, pound in the ass, no reach around jungle. Now's not the time to panic, green beans. He could have gone back to the negotiating table, but instead he went all sneaky. By 1991, Sony were proudly announcing the launch of a a new hybrid console at CES after producing several different prototypes of the new PlayStation. But just one day later, at the very same show, Nintendo announced that it had pulled out of the Sony collaboration and had instead signed a new deal with Philips to produce a CD-ROM add-on for the SNES. This came as a surprise to everybody, particularly a deeply humiliated Sony who had now been made to look sillier than a naked mannequin sporting a pair of gar, -gar goggles. This is so silly. A messy core battle followed in which Sony threatened to produce the new hybrid console anyway, whilst Nintendo attempted to secure a legal injunction over the use of the name PlayStation, and we all know how that went. Both companies eventually struck a deal in 1992 which would have allowed Sony to produce the new console, but now it was Sony's turn to give Nintendo a two-finger salute by dropping the SNES compatibility idea and focusing instead on producing the next generation of console. All of this turned out to be unbelievably bad news for Nintendo. The alternative deal with Philips never really happened. Instead, Philips simply released a string of new official games starring familiar Nintendo characters for its own short-lived CD1 console. Never heard of that. Never heard of it. Is that a thing? That that existed? <laughs> no one cared for it. Because my mates, we had... Uh, and everyone's like, Simon, why didn't you have the previous generation of console? I don't know. I don't know if it's a UK thing or whatever. I'm 35 now. Just turned. Happy birthday, me. My first console was a PlayStation 1. Some of my mates had N64s, but everyone kind of had that same gen. Then we all got PlayStation 2s, but I never had any of the ones before that, like SNESs or any of that stuff. Super cartridges. What were I don't even know what they're called. I got a PC. We gamed on PC a little bit, like Commander Keen. Um, that's all I can really remember, actually. Played a lot of Commander Keen. These included New Mario and Legend of Zelda titles, and all of them are now almost universally recognized as the very worst game in each of the long-running franchises, and Nintendo's fortunes took a tumble over the next decade as it stuck stubbornly with cartridges for the N64 in 1996 and then moved onto optical discs for the GameCube in 2001. Okay, so 1996, N64 released around the same time as the first PlayStation, right? So I was eight. There we go. Easy. Both consoles were knocked out of the park. No, I was nine. 87 is when I was born. Both consoles were knocked out of the park, respectively, by Sony's PlayStation 1 and 2. Nintendo had scored a massive own goal by encouraging Sony to enter the video game market for the first time and then pushing them off a cliff at the last minute. By royally screwing them over, Nintendo would then encourage Sony to go it alone and develop the most successful console brand in history. It's amazing, isn't it? Nintendo had inadvertently forged its own biggest rival and would pay the consequences for years to come. A prototype of the almost mythical Nintendo PlayStation was found in an attic in 2015 and was sold at auction in 2020 for wait for it. 
This is a big number. $360,000. It's the price of a house. Mad. Not a bad result for an attic find, but the seller had been hoping for close to a million. The fallout from the Nintendo PlayStation cost Nintendo a lot more than that, though. <laughs> Curry the Robot Companion. Some of the most promising, and I'm having some coffee. <sighs> Brought to you by Nespresso. Very, very cold Nespresso. Not through Nespresso's fault. I love Nespresso. Um, look, Nespresso, when George Clooney leaves. Ah, ah. Ah, uh, ah, uh, why not, eh? I'll be cheaper, I promise, but still very expensive. And almost as good looking, eh? Some of the most promising and revolutionary concepts are often developed by accident after a genius designer suddenly realized that their original idea was absolutely shit. The roboticist Sarah Ossentowski and Kaijin Kasiao initially dreamed up a concept for a little home security robot who would patrol the interior of your home while you were out and keep its electronic eyes peeled for unwelcome intruders. Wait, so they invented a CCTV camera? I guess it can move? It better be able to do something. It sadly wouldn't be equipped with death lasers or anything like that. That'd be alarming. It would just send you a message that your house was being burgled and you'd maybe consider coming back home pronto. Of course, the reason why this was a crap idea is that the robot is only alerting you after the burglar has already gained access and is rifling through your sh**. At that point, it's a bit late in the day to do much about it, so Sarah and Kaijin scrapped their original plans and decided instead to turn their robot into a friendly and almost useful companion or pet. <laughs> we tried to make a security system. Uh, it was a bit sh**. So we just called it a, a robot pet. And uh, given that we don't have robot pets, I'm going to imagine it just turned out to be a bit shit. Do you guys remember Furbies? They were creepy and shit. And they were always advertised like, this Furby responds to your commands. It knows when you pet its belly. And I'm like, oh my God. I remember I was, I was a young kid. And I remember being like, oh, shit. Furbies are cool. Furbies are cool. And I didn't have pets as a kid. We had some cats for a while. But like my, my my parents weren't big into animals, and I was like, Furby's the next best thing, isn't it? Sick. I want a Furby. Got a Furby. It was shit. Curry the Robot Companion was first proudly previewed to the world at the 2017 CES by Mayfield Robotics, a Californian startup company entirely funded by the German engineering company Bosch. Mayfield had promised that the cute little white robot would be available at the end of the year, and was priced at seven hundred ninety nine dollars. <laughs> Hell. <laughs> That's a lot of money for a fake pet. But what exactly could Curry do to justify that price tag? Well, he could move around your home with the aid of mapping sensors and take pictures of any sudden, unusual movements, such as the cat being sick all over the carpet. Wait, so did they really change this much from the original concept? <laughs> it sounds like they just took their moving security robot, stuck some, I don't know, some furry ears on it or something. He could perform all the typical functions you might expect from Alexa or Google Home. If you batted his head, he would look up with adoring eyes. He could make random beeping noises. It's only now that I come to write this that I realize Curry actually sounds a bit wank. It's <laughs> Danny, now, now is the point in the video you realize this sounds a bit wank. This felt a bit wank from when someone said robotic companion. That's when it sounded a bit wank. There's a joke there about robotic companions and wanking, isn't there? Which, uh, I don't know if wanking is a phrase used in America, but it means masturbation. There's a, there's a joke in there somewhere, I'm just not finding what it is. It's possible that future versions of the robot might have given him slightly more practical functions, but we'll never know. Although Curry continued to generate hype and pre-orders following further appearances at TED Talks and Innovation Summits, Ma why? No, why is it no one wants this shit? Mayfield Erotics were genuinely gutted when they announced later that year that the project had been put on indefinite hold and all the customers would receive refunds. Well, you don't get that with Kickstarter, do you? It appears that Bosch, the parent company holding the purse strings, had decided that Curry was simply not a business fit. Of course, several other companies have been developing household robots in recent years, but they always seem to be plagued with troubling technical difficulties. Most memorably, LG's marketing chief was made to look like a bit of a tit during the CES presentation in 2018. Have we left this behind? Can we say that this is now behind us and we no longer have to do this? That, what, five years ago we tried and we've moved on from robotic pets and maybe we can revisit it in like 2200 when we've got like proper AI and we can make, you know, organs and make them look real and shit, which is going to be crazy. He was showing off the company's new robot, Cloy, to an enraptured audience, only to find out that Cloy had gotten the face on him and refused to perform the simplest of tasks. Am I ready on my washing cycle? Even robots have bad days. 
But although we've been promised robot butlers for at least a century, it perhaps seems more likely that there really isn't a need for such contraptions in the future. Yo, a fully functional, effective robot butler? I'd I'd want this shit of that but it's realistically so far away <laughs> we've already reached a point where the disembodied voices of alexa and friends are helping to sort out our <laughs> hardly i have like um oh what's that the the, the i don't want to say it because i'll activate the series so it's still so shit. i got it and i can turn all all my lights and my studios through siri but it never works so i always have to end up pressing buttons on my ipad why are we doing this? I fiddle about with our heating and activate small robotic vacuum cleaners like Roomba. It's tipped by many that the future will see further developments along these large, invisible lines, rather than a future in which a clunky android butler greets you when you get home from work and comes as he takes off your coat and hat. I'd love that sh that would be awesome. I'm always like, get home, you gotta take out. I'm always listening to some music, take out my earpods, take off my jacket, take my sunglasses off, put my regular glasses on, make a cup of tea. All of I'd love a butler to do this for me. I seen the fact is I just have to get a butler. <laughs> but if there was a robot I could buy for 800 quid, I'd buy the sh out of that. And even the roboticists aren't convinced anyone really wants a cute pet robot in the meantime. UC Berkeley roboticist Ken Goldberg says, If I'm lonely, the last thing I want is a robot to come in and somehow be my friend. That's even more depressing. You're right, Ken, isn't it? You're right. You're bang on, mate. But even the experts are completely wrong, and we will all eventually be interacting regularly with creaking hunks of metal in the home. Let's just wait and see what Lady Gaga has to say about this. Says about this? What's wrong with you, Simon? It says say right there on the script. What does Lady Gaga have to say about this, you big brain? Ah, oh, this has been an episode of Brain Blaze. Thank you so much for watching. Smash that like button. Yes, yes, and I'll see you next time. Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, Lady Gaga. Lady Gaga? Oh, Gaga goggles. Oh, Lady Gaga, you're so weird.